Hello, everyone. I'm Pastor Joel Pledge from Crossroads Assembly of God in Three Way, Tennessee. Welcome to this Facebook Live broadcast. If you're watching by YouTube, you're welcome as well. God bless you for tuning in and joining us tonight. We've been on, this is our Wednesday night uh, Bible study, and we've been on a topic of solving life's problems. We're going to look at the family tonight, husband and wife relationships, as well as uh, just a few parenting tips. But I'd like you to, to understand as we lay a foundation for um, solving problems in the, in the home, that first of all, every family should be built upon a foundation of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's so important for us to recognize that that relationship makes all the difference in the world for us. Secondly, church should be a priority in, in your life. You should make that attendance together, pray together, worship together. Worship as a family wherever possible. Serving the Lord should be done together, a singular purpose of pleasing the Lord in everything. And finally, our relationship should be governed by biblical principles as well. The laws of love and of grace, of mercy and forgiveness, blessing and encouragement, servant, service and servanthood. These things will lay a foundation for us uh, for the future, even if you've been married for 40 years as I have, or whether or not you're just beginning your walk with, with the Lord and with your spouse. Our, our text gives to us a lot of, of problems that crop up in, the, in relationships. There can be spiritual differences. There can be uh, differing sexual needs. There can be unfaithfulness, immorality, sin. There can be divorce, there can be a lack of respect, jealousy, or communication, busyness, financial problems, parenting problems, extended family problems. And uh, the Bible doesn't talk about all of those things. It does give us principles to, to live by. But it does, in certain instances, give to us, um, um, uh, um, it speaks exactly or directly to an issue. One of those places is, is in the spiritual um, differences that we have. And sometimes we find ourselves, um, maybe we, we uh, were, weren't believers, and then we came to the Lord after we were married, and our spouse doesn't believe, and, and so we ended up going to church alone. Uh, sometimes that works out. Sometimes it's no problem. Uh, usually the Cases that I have found is, is that the wife uh, is the believer and the husband just stays home and allows the wife to, to give, and in most cases to give and to participate within the life of the church. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes that husband demands that that wife be home. Sometimes it breaks the marriage down completely because of the unequal yoke between the two. That's a biblical term from King James days. Uh, but... Um, we recognize. Now, the Bible tells us something um, that, you know, speaking as single people, we shouldn't be dating people who are have a different religious background than what we have. We've got to come to an agreement on that. It's a spiritual issue. We may be all concerned about their personality or their looks or their job and how we respect and whatever, but one of the most important things is our spiritual values and do they match. Um, so I encourage you, if you're single, make that one of your priorities. I also just say to you that, that being different uh, or having uh, uh, being believer and an unbeliever together, the Bible tells us that it doesn't demand for us to, um, to get a divorce. It does say to us, if um, uh, the unbelieving spouse says, you know, I just don't want to live with you anymore. You, you're off on this religion kick, and I, it's not where I want to be. And then they decide to leave. The Bible then tells us that we're free from that relationship. In other words, that we're free to marry again. Now, that's not the case biblically for everything. The Bible, the Bible, and we're going to talk about divorce in just a minute, but the Bible gives to us some guidelines that divorce shouldn't be entered into on a whim. Marriage shouldn't be entered into on a whim either. 
Um, but divorce definitely should not. It's a covenant that you make before God and man, and it should be honored. And that covenant should be honored as long as possible and in, in whatever condition, uh, whatever the conditions are. Um, so if you find yourself in a relationship where you're unequally yoked, you're a believer, they're not a believer, and they want to leave, the Bible says don't fight it, let it go, um, and, and you're free to marry again. Divorce is something that God uh, hates. Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16 tells us that. Um, Israel had a very lenient um, divorce policy. The husband could just divorce his wife for anything. The wife could not divorce her husband. And Jesus confronts this in the New Testament because he lays down the, the, the rule or the principle um, and in Matthew 5 and 31, he says, a man can divorce his wife, or you've heard that the law has said, a man can divorce his wife by merely giving a written notice of divorce. But I say to you that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. I want to say to you, the word Jesus uses here is not for the physical act of adultery, but of sexual immorality of any kind, okay? So uh, Jesus talks about divorcing a wife because the husband was the only one in those days could, who could initiate a divorce in Jewish society. So he couldn't say to that woman, well, if your husband is unfaithful, you need to divorce him. He could only speak to the husband, okay? Now, in our world, the, the, the authority goes both ways, and the principle is there. The, 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 the couple should stay together without, with these exceptions, okay? Number one, have they been uh, sexually immoral, all right? Not just unfaithful, but sexually immoral. And... Um, um, Paul is going to add to that uh, the exceptions or the, the causes for divorce that are acceptable in the sight of God. And he'll, he'll have that one that I mentioned earlier, abandonment. If the unbelieving spouse, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15, if the husband or wife who isn't a believer insists on leaving, let them go. In such cases, the believing husband or wife is no longer bound to the other God has called you to live in peace. And so there is there is this, um, the, that, that principle that is there. At the present time, you know, I, I read through uh, the Assemblies of God um, paper on marriage and divorce, and they do not bring up the topic of, uh, of abuse. And I personally believe that physical Emotional, sexual abuse qualifies as an acceptable cause for divorce. The offending spouse has broken the covenant by violence, the threat of violence, or by merely measures that are meant to control and manipulate their spouse. They're not fulfilling the law of love and of grace. So when the covenant that's made before God. You're called to love, to, to cherish, to honor. That covenant is not only ignored, but it is forcefully violated. Then I believe that it is, it is acceptable to, um, to divorce because the covenant's already been broken. It's already been damaged. And it, it frees the innocent spouse. I know that Many people would say that it's not biblical to do so or that God expects uh, the abused spouse to stay in the covenant because God hates divorce. But the God who loves us enough to send Jesus to die for us also loves us enough to free us from a destructive relationship. I want you to know that if you're being abused today, God gives to you that freedom of divorce. Now, again, Jesus talks here about unfaithfulness or, or um, committing adultery. He uses a word that really refers to all kinds of immorality, and it's sexual immorality in particular. Um, and so um, 
in our day, uh, we may have a spouse addicted to pornography. We may have a spouse that's engaging in, in relationships uh, non um, o- online. Okay, we we may be having people who are involved in emotional relationships. There's all kinds of sin that violates the covenant in today's world. We we are living in a in a sinner's paradise, if you will. Um, the Bible gives to us those options. Jesus says if, if the spouse is unfaithful, then you may divorce. It doesn't require you to divorce them. You know, if, if, there, if there is a desire in your heart to restore that relationship, and your spouse wants to restore the relationship, then all, by all means, allow God to restore that relationship. Don't just gloss it over. Get some counseling. Go to church, find someone that can help you, a small group, a support group, find something that will give to you the ability to not only to to forgive, but also to restore the relationship. So it's not required. Divorce is not required, but but, um, I do believe healing is necessary. Okay, it's a damage to your soul, to your spirit, for your spouse to commit adultery. So you need uh, to be restored, and you need to be um, um, to be healed of that. All right. I want to give to you uh, a, 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 a biblical foundation for the family and for the marriage relationship. You know, as I as I began, I, I told you. Uh, you know, we need to build our marriage on the foundation of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to see that where I come from with this is, is that, that, that the church of the New Testament was usually a house church. I know some of them weren't. The church in Jerusalem wasn't primarily a house church. They met in the temple yards. Um, 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 Paul met in a, in a, in a, in a hall in Corinth. There, there, there was exceptions, but many times the church was meeting in a home. It did in Philippi. It probably met in the jailer's house for a long time. Um, there was a church there in Cornelius' household, okay, uh, in Acts 10. So when God talks to that church, he's talking to a home. He's talking to a family. He's talking to a husband and a wife. And so when he develops this idea that you should love one another and serve one another and forgive one another, then he's talking not only to the church, but he's talking to the family. Those instructions, any instruction given to the New Testament church is given to the New Testament family. I'm I'm adamant about this, and this is something that God has has revealed to me and touched me with. I I just want you to see this. If we go just to one passage, and I could go to a hundred, but if I just go to one in Ephesians 4 and 5, I can can show you this, um, this connection that we have. Let's see if I can bring that up. There's a great shot. Uh, The church and home connection. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 through 5, 3. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. He's talking to the church, isn't he? But he's talking also to your home. Okay? Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Again, he's talking to the church. He's talking to our home, to our families. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you are his dear children. We're in the family of God. Imitate the family of God. God's the father. Fathers imitate him in everything you do because you're his dear child and you're going to be just like him as a father. Okay, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Hallelujah, what a thought. All right, it's a marvelous thing to see. I got one more verse there to give to you. There, there are, let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people, God's church, or God's family. 
Okay, so it's very important for, for you. I believe that God's speaking to the church and to the family. Now, at the end of all of these lists of sins that Paul says you shouldn't be a part of, he says there in verse 21, he's going to say to us, um, that verse, he, ah, he can't see it, but it says this, further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay, um, I'm going to get all these verses in and then I'll talk to you about them. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as well to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is head of the church. He's the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Amen? Wow. Wow. There's one other verse about the headship that I want you to get before I uh, before I go, it says this. There's one thing I want you to know, Paul says, the head of every man is Christ. The head of the wife is the man, and the head of the of Christ is God. All right? So uh, you have it. The wife, you got a head, the husband. The husband has a head, Christ. Christ has a head, God. All right? Well, I, I didn't get on the big screen, did I? <laughs> All right. Well, you say, well, why is that in, important? Because I want you to understand to the church, he said, submit to one another. He's never going to directly tell that husband to submit to his wife because, well, he's just never going to do that. He is going to tell the husband to love that wife as Christ loved the church. And Jesus uh, will tell everyone to love one another, serve one another, um, um, we, forgive one another. You've got to apply these to the family, to the church, and to the family. Someone will say to us, as I read to you from both Ephesians and Corinthians, the husband is head of his wife. That means he's in charge. <laughs> he's in charge. Well, remember, remember, you got the you got the wife. You got the husband, he's the head. You got the husband, Christ is the head. You've got Christ, God, if I will, God the Father is the head. So let me look about, let me look at that relationship between Jesus and the Father. Do we see the Father uh, lording over his power, lording over Jesus and directing him? Jesus says, I only do what I see the Father doing. I only say what I see, hear the Father saying. Hmm. This is not a power relationship. This is a question of a source relationship. God the Father is supplying the agenda. He needs something to be done. He gives the power to do it. Jesus supplies the body, the hands and the feet, to do what God the Father needs to be done. So God the Father speaks to the Son, and the Son shares with the people what he hears. Is the Father controlling every word out of the mouth of Jesus? No. He's got a lot of freedom to say what he needs to say. Is he stopping Jesus from saying something that he thinks or desires? No, he's not controlling Jesus. He's supplying Jesus with the words to speak. Jesus is yielding to the Father, that's submitting to the Father, because the Father is the head of Christ. He's speaking the words uh, to the people that the Father wants to hear. The Father is a source of wisdom and knowledge and power. The words that he speaks are the words of the Father. I see, if you will, to understand the head has taken upon in our day uh, a new understanding. In the biblical times, the head was not the most important part of the body. The head is not the all-powerful controlling authority, the decision-making part of the body. God the Father was the head of Christ, and he was a source of wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge, power, direction, instruction, in a source, a source of those things, not the power and authority over Jesus. 
if you look into the Old Testament, and this carries over into the Jewish mindset, the thought of man was centered in the heart of man. I don't think I have these verses. Maybe I do. Yes, I do. Let me give to you some of these things on the heart. G uh, Proverbs write, guard your heart above all things because it determines the course of your life. It's not your thoughts of your brain or of your head. It's the thoughts of your heart. It's the decisions the heart makes that are important. Okay? Let's see this again. Fire tests the purity of gold or silver, but the Lord tests the heart. <laughs> Boy, I got, I'm missing a few here. Let me see if I can find them. Just a second. Okay. I got that one. Guard your heart. I got that one. The Lord tests the heart. Again, it's not the testing of the brain or the mind. He's testing the heart. Is that heart pure? Well, I'm missing some slides here. Let me give you some other verses. Psalm 139 and 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. <laughs> Are you with me? God didn't say, or, or the psalmist didn't say, search my mind to see what thoughts are there. Search my head to see what thoughts are there. It was the heart that was all important. Not the mind, not the brain, not the head. It was the thoughts of the heart. Proverbs 3 and 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Wait a minute. I trust the Lord with my heart, not my head, not my mind, but with my heart. Because that's where understanding is. I can't depend upon my own understanding. Okay? And then again, I end up there. The Lord tests the heart. My point is, is that Christ is the head of the church. Okay? We think in the Western mindset that the head is the authority, the one who makes the decisions, the one who's in charge, the one with all the power. But as Christ is head of the church, it's his body. It does mean that he makes decisions for that body, that he makes some decisions for that body, if not all the decisions. But he is not controlling everyone, and it is not indicative of him being the top authority. It means that he is the source of every good thing that comes to the body. Oh, listen, listen to me. This is a simple truth, if you can get it. All food comes through the head. It comes right here through the mouth. All nourishment comes through thus the head. Everything I hear, which is instruction, wisdom, knowledge, um, uh, counsel, all comes through my hearing. Where is it? Where do, where, where do I hear? I hear right here. It's in my head. All the air that comes into my lungs comes through my nose and my mouth. Where, where is that? That's the head. All light that enters into my brain and gives me vision comes through my eyes. Where are my eyes? Are they in the end of my fingers, my toes, my belly button? No, it's my head. The head is the source of every good thing that comes to the body. Oh, hallelujah. If I could see that about Jesus, I would know that my head is supplying everything I need for life, for godliness. It's all coming through Jesus. Jesus is hearing the words of the Father, and they're coming directly to the body. He's nourishing that body with that which he consumes. He's seen into the future, given to me everything that I need for tomorrow. Listen, the head of the body is the source of every good thing. Jesus is making decisions today that affect the body, that allow the body to, to function in this world. And so the husband is the head of his family, the head of his wife. He's the source or is to be the source of every good thing, every wholesome thing, everything that blesses, everything that encourages, everything that helps his wife to grow spiritually, emotionally, in every way to grow. So listen, if there are problems... Maybe there are sexual problems. They can be worked out because of love and, and, and acceptance and forgiveness and the desire to serve and to bless. There may be a lack of, of respect and honor in a marriage. 
But if the husband is the head of his wife and he's the source of all good things, he will pass those on. She's going to receive those things with joy and with thanksgiving and respect and honor is going to be one of those things that come. There will be open communication because that's what love, acceptance, and forgiveness does. It creates open communication. You know, there's going to be times in our lives that life gets busy. Uh, somebody's going to have to work some overtime hours. Uh, the kids are going to have a baseball, softball, football, practice, this, that, and everything. And we're going to be on the run all the time. And it tends to break down the family, if you will. So there will be times that we have to rebalance. We have to rework. and uh, But we, we can talk through those things. If we have built the correct foundation, I've given to you this concept of the husband being the head of the house as the source of all good things. I do want to close out. <laughs> I do want to try to close out with, with uh, some um, um, instructions that the Bible gives to us. The husband is um, to be the priest in the home. That's the spiritual leader of that home. He's to be the provider. We're talking finances here. We'll provide for shelter and home and, and these things. He's also to be the lover of his wife. I, I would say that, I, you know, I, I put the lover of his wife, but I, I really believe he could be the head of his wife. That's his, that's his calling, and he would love his wife as Christ loved his church. Amen. The wife, on the other hand, um, now, listen, I, I want you again, I, I'm just going to emphasize the wife is, is equal and is equal creation before God. She is not lesser than the man or her husband. She is equal in the sight of God. But she is called to submit to her husband, his head, because he's the source of every good thing. That's the only place she's going to be fed. And then she's also called to live that Christian life, those things that are outlined for the church. Uh, she is called to live that out. Amen? She is called to live that out. Now, um, one of those verses, let me get back up here. Um, yeah, I've just got a few minutes left, so I'm trying to go through um, as quickly as I can. Titus, and Paul, when he wrote to Titus, he said to to uh, to the to the church there teach the older women to live in a way that honors God isn't that great they must not slander others or be heavy drinkers instead they should teach others what is good <clears throat> these older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children to live wisely and to be pure to work in their homes to do good and to be submissive to their husbands then they will not bring shame on the word of God. <clears throat> Amen. Excuse me. <clears throat> Amen. Well, let me just talk about the responsibility of parents as I close out tonight. And um, I, I, I want to say this to you. Number one, um, when you're disciplining your children or teaching your children or directing your children, um, speak with clarity. You know, we need to direct our children on the right path. The Bible says when they're older, they'll not, they'll not depart from it. I've got to train up a child in the way he will go. So I've got to do it with clarity. I've got to tell them what I expect. I've got to tell them. Um, uh, I've, I've, I've got to do that, okay? I must be fair with them. I cannot discipline them. Uh, one day with a, you know, a, a seven-day um, um cutting off of <laughs> all privileges <clears throat> because they spilled their milk at, at the at the supper table. After the third time that you told them, watch, that, watch your glass, watch your glass, watch your glass. Okay, <clears throat> whatever we do, the, the, uh, whatever we do has to be fair. It has to be clear. Uh, we don't want to, to embitter them at all. Another thing that we must do is we must be consistent. Clarity, consistency. In other words, every time that behavior crops up, we, we need to correct it. 
We can't overlook it. We can't encourage it. We can't laugh at it. We have to consistently say that's, that's not acceptable in my home. I've got to tell them what they're doing because sometimes they don't understand. I was laughing uh, this week. As, as many of you know, we have a, an 18-month-old or somewhere around there, 20-month-old um, grandchild in our home, and, and uh, he was throwing a little fit. He's been throwing a few fits these days and just really screaming. And, and uh, so he was doing that, and I just picked him up and just put him in a chair. I got one of my my leather chair there. I says, if you're going to do that, this is where you need to do that. Well, you're not going to do it in the kitchen. And I just walked away, and, you know, he looked at me like, what are you talking about, Papa? I just don't understand it. Before I knew it, he was just sitting there completely doing something completely different and engaging in himself instead of instead of telling me what I was doing wrong. And I, I believe that that's a place where we come up with this, this, the consequences. In other words, we have to tell them, well, in that case, I just told a 20-month-old, well, if you're going to scream like that, you're going to sit in this chair, Okay. If you're going to scream like that, it was uh, the consequences weren't too too terrible. Uh, again, we have to be consistent, we have to be clear, but we have to have consequences for behaviors in which are unacceptable in our lives. You know, the Bible tells us that all love should be done, all love, all discipline should be done in love. Okay, um, Jeremiah wrote this. For no one is abandoned by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he also shows compassion because the greatness of his unfailing love. He does not enjoy hurting people or causing them sorrow. So the Lord's going to come and he's going to bring healing and he's going to bring restoration and he's going to bring wisdom and knowledge and understanding as well. But I believe that we have to do any everything that we do with our kids out of a heart of love, not a heart of exasperation, not a heart of tiredness, not a heart of of uh, <laughs> of unforgiveness or or harshness, but to be clear, to be consistent, and well to give the consequences of what uh, um, are going to take place. Well, listen, God bless you tonight. Um, thank you for joining with us. I would encourage you to uh, um, to meditate upon some of those things that I said tonight because they're different from anything that you're going to run across in any marriage book. But the church, when God's talking to the church, he's talking to the disciples, he's talking to you, husbands, he's talking to you, wives. God bless you. Thank you for listening. Um, amen. Amen. Father, make this real to our lives today. Let your word speak to us volumes, and we give you praise for that word. Let it change our lives. Let it transform our thinking. Let it transform our relationships, I pray. Amen. Amen. God loves you. So do we.